Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us on this afternoon in spite of the somewhat dreary weather. I'm Sohini Ramachandran. I am the director of the Data Science Institute. And I'd really like to welcome you all to the third in a year-long series of conversations on campus convened as a partnership between the Provost's Office and the Data Science Institute on AI and our data-driven society at Brown. Through panels featuring the expertise of faculty and staff from across the university, we hope to engage the broader university community in cross-disciplinary discourse about our data-driven world and stimulate new research connections, pedagogy, and cross-disciplinary interactions about how AI affects and can improve our work and our lives. Today's event focuses on AI and power. All too often, the tools of AI and automation more broadly have been used to threaten our welfare and have eroded trust in our democratic institutions. But these deeply, deeply harmful outcomes need not be inevitable. How can we design guardrails and governance that protect us from the worst excesses of unchecked technology deployment? How can we design socio-technical systems that empower people, particularly those who have been historically marginalized? Today, we'll touch on these questions and more. Our moderator of today's panel is Frank Doyle, who is professor of engineering and the 14th provost of Brown University. As the university's chief academic officer and chief budget officer, he works closely with the president to advance the university's mission of teaching, research, and service. And as dean of engineering and applied sciences at Harvard, Frank helped launch the $500 million Kepner Institute, Kepner Institute sorry, for the study of natural and artificial intelligence in 2022. So thank you, Frank. All right, Sahini, thank you. Uh, truly, thank you for the partnership on this series. It's been really engaging. Um, so we've got some, um, a star-studded cast here to uh, speak with us about this challenging topic. And I'm going to go through and ask each of them in, in order here, Kim, Malik, and Suresh, to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about their own background, their perspective here. And I thought as kind of an opener question, I'd also ask each of them to share their definition of what power means in the context of our conversation here. So, Kim, could I ask you to lead off? Sure, um, so thank you for uh, this opportunity to speak with everyone. I'm Kim Gallen in the Africana Studies Department, an associate professor, and I really come to this conversation, um, which I didn't think I would be on a panel like this um, about five or six years ago. My, my um, sort of introduction and real work in um, technology and data comes out of the pandemic. Um, and. I uh, started one of the first uh, led um, academic responses to the uh, pandemic back in 2020. I can't believe it's almost four years ago now. It's been a really interesting um, past four years. Um, and so since that time, I've really been heavily um, moving into the direction of uh, data, um, AI technology, and health e equity. Fantastic, great. Uh, Malik, can you go next? Yeah, um, Malik Boykin. I'm a assistant professor in the Cognitive Linguistic and Psychological Sciences Department. Uh, social psychologist by training, but uh, on a <clears throat> random interaction uh, on the Martha's Vineyard ferry, uh, a buddy of mine <laughs> said, uh, "You know, once we got into a conversation about what we did, he said, uh, you know, you should meet my friend Sarah. She's interested in similar things as you." Uh, and next thing I know, I was getting together with his friend uh, who is a machine learning engineer, but who studies inequality uh, and, and many of the topics that, that we think about um, collectively. And that was the beginning of me even thinking about how uh, my work on racism and power and, and measurement, uh, psychological measurement of, of people's attitudes could intersect with machine learning. So I had no clue that this would be a, a path that I would go down, but now Sarah and I have a, um, a joint lab we've been running for a number of years. Uh, and uh, largely, we are uh, measuring attitudes uh, towards fairness metrics uh, in, in, the, in service of debiasing algorithms. So that's a big part of what we do. And do I say the power definition now or later? Or Why don't we go, we'll go back through it. We'll go back through. All right. <laughs> and I will, uh, By the way, you're another great example of serendipitous collisions. <laughs> right. I really yeah, love to promote. That's a great example. Yep, yep. Terrific. Suresh. Hi, I'm, I'm Suresh Venkatasaranian. I'm a professor of computer science and data science. And I direct the Center for Tech Responsibility, Reimagination, Redesign within the Data Science Institute. Um, I work broadly in questions around algorithmic fairness and societal decision, um, machine learning used for automated decision making, both the underlying technical questions, the broader socio-technical questions, 
as well as the policy issues, the governance and guardrails that Sohini was referring to um, around this. And if you, if you want another serendipitous sort of event, the first paper I ever wrote on this topic was about the use of uh, thinking about the legal notion of disparate impact in the context of machine learning. And this only happened because I was at a dinner Yay for interdisciplinarity. I was at dinner uh, having given a talk and talked, was talking to a sociologist mm -hmm. who was telling me about the Griggs versus Duke Power case in the Supreme Court that led to the establishment of the Doctrine of Disciplinary Impact. And I said, huh, that's interesting. Ten years later, here I am. Fascinating. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, so our theme is really this, um, you know, challenge or tension AI and power. On one hand, there's great hope that there could yeah. be a leveling of a playing field of democratization. But... There's the fear that this could amplify and further divide. So I thought maybe as an icebreaker, just to kind of get us into the conversation, could I ask each of you to define power as it is relevant to your work and your perspective on this? Yeah. Um, great question. Incredibly complicated. But I think it's a really good question to start us off in our conversation. And um, you know, thinking about power, the way that I define power, and I should say I'm, I'm formally trained as a historian, and I have some other degrees in there that um, you, I can talk to you about at another time. But power is, uh, for me, coming from my perspective, which is deeply rooted in studying the histories of in inequality in this country, um, is the ability to impact, influence, change um, the circumstances around yourself, and even the ones that are directly impact you and ones that don't. Um, I think about power in very deeply relational ways, very deeply contextual ways. Power is not static. It changes over time. Um, power can be located in some of the most marginalized, minoritized communities, even as they may be disempowered. And so I think power is very multifaceted um, and something that um, can't just sort of be contained. Fair enough. Malik, your, your turn. Yeah, I uh, think about power in terms of resource allocation and just the uh, ability to allocate resources. Uh, and if that is, if there's an imbalance uh, in that um, ability, then you have, um, you know, power differential. And that's typically, you know, I feel like it, it will often boil down to, to, you know, something as simple as that. Terrific. Great. Suresh. I, I think I think about power in terms of who has it and who doesn't. Um, as you mentioned earlier, Provost, the issue of you know, uh, uh, the issue of you know technology as being hopefully flattening and giving more power. It often takes away power and consolidates power. It's another vehicle for the consolidation of power amongst those who already have it. And so, on the one hand, when I think about the work we do in sort of thinking about responsible technology, it's about trying to make visible that agglomeration and accumulation of power that technology is allowing for. But on the other hand, preserving that optimistic view of technology as a leveler, thinking about how we can use technology to redistribute power, to sort of give power back to those who have it, or even better, help them take power back from those who have taken it from them. So I think that's how I think about it in relation to technology. Fascinating dimensions, yeah, from leveling to the differential to uh, taking away wonderful, wonderful aspects. I know we'll, we'll dig into deeper. So, yeah. Kim, I wonder if we could start with you. And we hear a lot of people talking about fairness in yeah. technology, yeah. right? That's an often uh, invoked term. Yeah. I wonder if you can speak about what that means in the context of your own work and how it influences your research. Yeah. Um Fairness for me initially comes with my two teens arguing about what's fair and what's not, right? <laughs> so I have a really you know, intimate understanding and relationship to fairness uh, from that perspective. But fairness in terms of technology, when I think about the work that I do and have been doing recently as it re uh, relates to AI technology, it really involves synthetic data. And synthetic data um, it has been around for a while, so it's not a, a new concept, but it's really taken off in these last couple of years of generative models where the machine learning community is making a case that um, that you know you can create synthetic data off of uh, original training data set. And there's, I think, a lot of really good, important things that can happen with synthetic data. Um, for example, you can, you know, people can generate uh, synthetic data uh, to train uh, algorithms on, um, you know, self-driving cars or how to detect bank fraud without compromising people's privacy. But one of the things that I think comes up with this notion of fairness is that synthetic data is only as good as the training data set is unbiased 
fixed and, and fair, right? Um, and so uh, when we think, when I think about fairness in, in terms of synthetic data, um, you know, what does it mean to be fair, right? Often people will say that we need a data set that's more diverse and, and representative of more communities and that, i.e., is fair. And, and that may be true to some degree, right? But I worry about fairness metrics or tech solutionism, this idea that we can just fix tech problems with tech fixes, right? Because if we can sort of cook up a batch of fair synthetic data, and right now it's not clear that we can and that there is a real notion of fairness, I tend to think more in um, language of equity right, as opposed to sort of fairness. But arguably, even if we could create fair synthetic data that was more representative, that was unbiased, and again, I'm not clear that that, that actually can be done. Um, one of the, the things that fair, a fairness metric gets us away from, at least in synthetic health data, is this idea that we have to engage communities in more humanistic ways in order to uh, engender trust to collect their data, right? A tech solutionist sort of problem like fairness um, in synthetic data um, sort of de-emphasizes the human connection to the data and sort of takes the human out of, of data collection. And so, um, you know, I'm not someone that is saying, you know, no synthetic data, no AI technology, but I am wary of a tech solutionist sort of idea that would say that we can just create fair synthetic data that's going to fix all the problems with um, bias and algorithms. So I'm hearing what you say, that even if the original data set happened to be fair and well distributed, right. the way you sample it and build a synthetic uh, yeah. record could fall afoul. It could, and and there's, all, there's lots of um, you know, other complications in terms of you know, what is the standardization for evaluating the synthetic data set? What is the standardization? standardization for the fair sort of metric or the fairness of sort of uh, process for making a synthetic data fair. And so um, on its surface, fairness sounds like a great solution, but there's some complexity that needs to be worked out with that. Yeah, and I hear you invoking the term metric uh, multiple times there. Yeah. So Suresh, I want to turn to you for a moment. And it's easy to think about, as, as an engineer myself, the, the notion of taking a mathematical approach and quantifying using metrics and so forth, fairness. But of course, I know from your work that you think deeply about the role of people in all this and, and putting people in the center. Can you talk to us a little bit about the challenges and sort of shifting that mindset to think about sort of more people-oriented thinking as opposed to math-oriented thinking? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to answer this very briefly, and I'm going to hand over to Malika. I think he's done even more than I have on this topic. So, um, I mean, it's funny because I was in my class, and some of my students are here. We were, we, we, I was teaching fairness metrics, and I, my class is very, um, I think it's a, it's a computer science class, but I think it's very challenging for students. But I keep telling them something. Oh, here's a fairness metric. And here's why it doesn't work. And here's another fairness <laughs> metric. And here's why that doesn't work. And they're like, can you tell us something that works? I'm like, my God, that's the problem with this topic. It's, it's not that simple. Right. But yeah, I mean, on the one hand, I like to tell people that, you know, if we are going to deal with automated decision systems that speak math, we have to find some way to communicate to these systems notions that are broader, societal, fuzzy, complex, contextual, like justice, equity, and fairness. We have these very imperfect proxies, these measures of fairness, whether, you know, depending on how you want to think about, you know, uh, equitable outcomes or equitable opportunity and things like that. But they're imperfect, but they're the best we have at trying to communicate something. But so we have to, on the one hand, we have to program into these systems while fully well recognizing that there are huge limits to what they can do. And I know, you know, I don't know, I want to throw you in the mix. I mean, I know you spent a lot of time thinking about how people think about this as well, right? Well, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, when you go in and you look at, uh, particularly with binary decision outcome, um, machine learning uh, decision makers, which is a, a lot of what I deal with, um, it, you can audit the decisions that it made and then disaggregate those decisions and see how they performed across members of different groups. Now, you will have most cases where by some metric or some other metric there will be unfairness like it would be hard mm -hmm. to have it uniformly exactly right. statistically uh, the same across a number of statistical fairness metrics for each group so then you're left with the decision of 
well, which of these imperfect uh, sets of outcomes is the most fair? Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the, the, the big issues there also is that it, it, there's, there's power involved in defining that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, and th it's often uh, uh, communities that are are marginalized that don't have much say in what is uh, what is fair, or that the thing that would be most fair for them is the thing that should be deployed and it is most fair. So, uh, with the, much of the work that we're doing, is trying to explain to people what are the difference but be differences between these fairness metrics, which is a hard thing to do. But it's also an important thing to do if we're going to just understand if there's systematic heterogeneity among how people are thinking about this that's also uh, demographic uh, specific. You know, if people from different communities are saying, no, I want this or I want that or, or, or what have you. Uh, but I think it's a necessary step that we need to, mm -hmm. to take to, uh, to, to get closer to um, uh, deploying things that people would consent to. Malik, I understand along those lines you were hinting at this, that you've been doing some work on training people, tutorials to help them understand, have a capacity to understand bias. Yeah. Share with us a little bit about some of your experiences with that work. Yeah, so uh, it's burgeoning work, uh, but um, one thing that we went into it with was the idea that we could teach uh, people about fairness metrics and you know, we're getting good feedback about that, right? Like, it, they're, they're hard things to understand, but um, we measure people at baseline, uh, and then we have this interface where people look at a graphic uh, of a continuum of models that they can slide between uh, and get, you know, dynamic feedback about how this model is performing across two different groups. Uh, comparing across two different fairness metrics. And we're asking people questions like define, show us, uh, slide the slider to the model that shows this or shows that or you know these other types of uh, um, questions. And people are improving. People are, you know, to this point with our, our first round, we're able to get, uh, you know, 20% improvement, uh, which is, is pretty substantial. And then the more that people are able to uh, get questions right over baseline from engaging with our tutorial, uh, they're able to answer additional questions about a theory of mind of people who have certain kinds of mm. fairness orientations. You know, this person thinks this way or that way, which model is the model that they would prefer? And out of 50 different models, you know, uh, well over chance, they're defining the correct model, which I think gets us a lot closer to then uh, taking you know, participants that had no exposure to this to being able to give their informed perspectives about what it is that they think is fair, uh, which opens up a lot of possibilities. I would imagine in any training exercise, like teaching or in a university, the, the nature of the sort of, let's say, diversity of learning styles in the mm -hmm. community, right? And in this case, maybe the range of technical expertise, the socioeconomic spectrum. Yeah. Is that something you've been able to probe so far with the work? Uh, not just just yet. Uh, this is certainly a thing that we're thinking about. Um, but in this moment, we just got a group of MTurk workers, just okay. people that we pay to take surveys online. Um, and it generally, you know, people do pretty bad on the baseline survey. They're not able to understand, you know, what model we're looking for. It's very confusing. Uh, but on the other side of it, you know, the amount to which they're able to learn um, has predictive value for, for, you know, their ability to, to, to make sense of a third person's value orientation of what model they would choose. So it, it, it's, it's um, an early indicator that we're, we're heading in the right direction, but it's also uh, a it's kind of a learning and development kind of uh, um, set of ideas as well. So it'll be iterative, right? Like we've learned like, wow, there are these concepts or these questions or this particular type of model people are less able to identify than the others. So how do we fix our tutorial to make this better the next time? Uh, and, you know, so it, it'll be a journey, but at least uh, we have some early indication that we are, are headed in a direction that can, can speak to some of the problems we'd like to solve. Terrific. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah.
Um, Kim, I, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about, um, you know, as I think about what's really to one degree fueling this AI revolution we're experiencing, mm -hmm. it's the unprecedented amount of data, right? Yeah. People talk about the volume, the velocity, the variety. And as we, we have that pressure on collecting more and more data, there's the inclination to invoke mechanisms that might cross over into surveillance, yeah. right? To collect different kinds of data. Right. So talk to us a little bit about the clash that yeah. we're going to encounter between surveillance and privacy, privacy yeah. across different communities. Yeah. So um, there's lots of data out there. And the one thing that AI needs is data. But there's a lot of terrible data out there. And I think, you know, uh, machine learning communities, um, people who are machine learning, um, you know, scientists, engineers, and I'm sure there are people in the room that can talk about, you know, at this point, you know, the need is for quality data, right? Um, and that means trying to find the best data. And so again, for my context, synthetic data sort of rises again as an important sort of uh, avenue to, to actually get data, right? And so, uh, a lot of the privacy issues, surveillance issues that are coming up around this conversation about synthetic data is the, uh, you know, does the uh, the people who may be reflected in that original data set, do they have the right to know that their data, the data that reflects them, um, is going to be used to train, um, uh, you know, to generate more synthetic data. Synthetic data being, you know, data that looks really um, almost identical, has all the statistical properties of the real original data set, but actually is a synthetic version of that. And so these issues around privacy, consent, right, uh, about what if your data is going to be used for synthetic data, because synthetic data for people who are really advocates of it is supposed to get around this notion of privacy, right? <laughs> we don't have to, we can just cook up a batch of data. We don't have to worry about consent or privacy, but then if there's that original data set. Um, and this notion of privacy and data, there's a, a really important um, research um, report that came out of the University of Penn, I think last year around um, you know, what people know and don't know about what's being done with their data. And, he, and, and Tarot, Joseph Tarot, who's the lead, or lead researcher on it, says that, you know, about uh, most people don't understand when they're signing these consent forms, which are you know, long and tedious to read, that um, they don't understand it. And, and many people are just resigned to it and knowing that they're either being surveilled or their data is being used, right? Um, and so this, this idea of synthetic data being a, a, a stopgap measure to get around informed consent, around privacy, I think is, again, really problematic because um, I think those stipulations and those regulations are there for a, a, a reason. Um, and I think that, um, you know, synthetic data, again, I'm not arguing against it, but it, it being put in place to sort of circumvent, I think, really important, um, important uh, regulations and stipulations about how our data is being used is, is something that should be examined really closely. Sounds like some really fascinating tech. And add a problems. twist to this. Yeah. Um, just this, this actually came out a few days ago, a paper. Uh, my colleague, actually, Holly Case in history, she sent this to me. Um, there was a paper that was looking at, well, what happens if we start using synthetic da data to train the next generation of language models or other mm -hmm. models, which generate more synthetic data, which, and so on. Yeah. And not surprisingly, I think, to people who study this, that feedback loop that gets created as you do this makes the models worse and worse and yeah. worse. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> MIT made synthetic data to uh, analogous. I have a piece coming out where they're about this, but they made uh, synthetic data analogous to diet soda. And I'm like, that's probably accurate, <laughs> but you don't want to make, you know, synthetic data uh, analogous to, you know, something that is, uh, you know, debatable about the, the in terms of its uh, health its impact on people's health. The last thing I'll say is though, you know, Google, Apple um, recently have tried to uh, come up with these labels for apps, like sort of like nutrition labels, or they're called like privacy labels to try to help people understand um, what their app, what an app might be sharing and not sharing to sort of warn people again, almost like the nutrition labels that 
um, we have on different food products to talk about sort of what the nutritional value. And they ha they're not really good. They're, I mean, but there are attempts to try to inform the public about how their data is being used. I don't know if that's the way to go because it, once again, um, a lot of times buried in that nutrition label, that data nutrition label, if you will, or privacy label, are all sorts of uh, language that is, wasn't either clear or had hidden um, the fact that the data was still going to be shared in certain ways. So these are, you know, and again, talking about power, um, I think what many of the American public really desperately wants is a more control and power over how their data is being shared. Great point, great point. Um, Suresh, I wonder if I could turn to sort of a um, topic in the news these days. I don't know if you're aware, it's an election year. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and lots of questions around AI and the integrity of the election process. Um, I think there was a story this morning in the paper about robocalls in New Hampshire um, impersonating Biden. So I understand you had a chance to educate some election commissioners recently, and I, we would love to hear how that experience went. Yes, yeah, so it feels like, wait, is an election happening and Trump and Biden are running? Wait, wasn't that, <laughs> yeah, no, wasn't that to the future, future. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, I was uh, given the opportunity to participate in an event run by Julia Angwin, who now is a journalist who now runs this organization called Proof News, and Alondra Nelson, my former boss and um, uh, magnificent person, so in general, who are running an event where they invited election officials from uh, different counties across the country, including some of the more critical ones like Maricopa County and in Georgia mm -hmm. and, and Broward County in Florida, together with journalists and um, AI experts, I say within scare quotes, uh, I was one of the mm -hmm. AI experts in the room, to sort of sit and interact with chatbots and ask questions mm -hmm. like, I would like, I live in area code, you know, 02906, where should I go to vote? You know, oh, what kind of ID do I need to take to my polling station? Simple questions that the election commissioners have said people constantly are asking about in election season. And so this was set up where you know, these questions would be asked to five different chatbots, and they would return answers. And the election commissioners, and they were designed so that you know, if the question was about Maricopa County, Florida, uh, Arizona, the, Arizona, the Maricopa County commissioner was the one who was evaluating the answers to that question. And so this, we did this whole evaluation, then they compiled all the results, and they wrote a report. It just came out yesterday. And I think from my experience being in the room, it was it was really interesting to see, first of all, the trepidation with which the election officials were approaching this project. Mm. They were very you know, worried about AI. They felt like it was something they didn't fully understand. They didn't know what to expect. Towards, and then by the end of the afternoon, thinking, wow, this stuff is really bad. Mm. <laughs> this is not good. Everyone keeps saying AI is awesome. This stuff is terrible. It gives <laughs> bad answers. It gives incorrect answers. It gives just answers that if someone a person gave them would be considered fraud hmm. because they were just outright, I wouldn't say lying because these are systems, but they were just giving answers that would direct you to the wrong place or tell you not to vote when you should. Things that would be illegal if a person were to do. So they were both very worried as a result of this, but also much more confident in their own ability to be the power hmm. to decide, to, to help people really understand what needs to happen when they vote. And they were like, instead of all these words that these chatbots were producing that were wrong, they should have just said, go to your election website. Mm -hmm. That would have been far more accurate than anything yeah. they were actually saying. Mm -hmm. So it made them feel you know, a, bit, a lot more comfortable that a, you know, the AI was not going to replace the important work they had to do, but also very concerned that people were going to try and use these chatbots to get answers to questions. They would be just completely wrong. Mm -hmm. So that's one part of it. I mean, you yeah. mentioned the robocalls. Yeah. So let me tell you another story. So in the afternoon session, we had some folks who were helping us develop deep fakes. So there was one group that was doing video deep fakes, one group doing you know, uh, images. I was in the audio deep fake group. So we had an election commissioner from one uh, county, and we, he sort of said something for 30 seconds. The expert in the room did some magic on 11 labs. Within two minutes, had the election commissioner voice saying, yeah, yeah, this is not the right day for the election. You need to go vote on this other day for the election. Wow. And he was like, do not release this to the public. It was, wow. it was that bad. Yeah. They, had, they basically took a snapshot of a speech that Nikki Haley had given, 30-second clip, and made her uh, drop out of the race and endorse Joe Biden for president. Mm. And, it was, and with, with uh, you know, an accent that I thought was a reasonably authentic imitation of a South Carolina accent as well. So 
all of this was happening. In that it, just, it, was, it was scary to see how easy it was to do these things, hence the robocall in New Hampshire. Right. Um, but also empowering to see the officials go back saying, no, actually, we know better than most of these systems what needs to happen. And we have the right information. And we could go back and tell people that, that we have the right information. So you, you intimated at the very beginning on the first topic that there was a zip code sort of entry. And I presume part of that was to identify the relevant resource. But how much bias or variance in accuracy did you get by zip code? So there were a number of questions, right? Is this inaccurate? Is this irrelevant? Is this biased? It was hard to sort of say that the answers were biased in any particular way, but they were wildly inaccurate hmm. and often irrelevant. And, and I, I, I didn't know this till I was talking to these folks, like oh, the, the person from Texas saying, well, you know, in this particular county of Texas, these forms of ID are acceptable and these forms of ID are not, and that's how it just works because a lot of this stuff is local. Those chatbots didn't know anything about that. Mm, <laughs> they were enough. saying all kinds of random things that had nothing to do with the specifics of that location. Uh, and, yep. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, hearing about sort of the chill and the, the fear on that topic, I, I'm inclined to turn to Malik and say, you know, we're talking about power and empowerment. We're talking about fear. Um, if you could give a kind of shout out, a call to action to somebody in this uh, domain, and I, I might ask the other two also to weigh in on this, mm -hmm. what would be your call to action as we think about this? Yeah, I mean, I feel like educating uh, the public uh, as, as best we can and putting real uh, uh, effort into, you know, teaching people pitfalls, helping to reduce people's anxieties uh, about how all of this works. I mean, uh, you know, in the example you just gave, people went from being anxious uh, uh, in their approach to it to you know feeling empowered and realizing that they uh, that that this is a tool uh, for use and uh, you know I also in the work that we're doing uh, am hoping uh, to teach people right like people come into our studies and uh, with uh, some amount of anxiety about AI right uh, and leave on the other side of it I, you know I've never seen so many thank you messages on the other side mm. of having people take a, it literally an hour long survey mm. like wow this is really interesting and i learned a lot and so on and so forth uh and it's it's worth the effort it's worth the effort uh uh to to humanize people and think about the fact that they can understand this stuff uh and that you know managing their anxieties is a is an important service that uh can be provided, uh, and also giving them agency to then do things about it uh, themselves, to advocate for themselves, like to understand what it is that they want uh, from AI so they, they can, um, you know, go to the polls and they can, you know, make the calls and or uh, participate in the kinds of efforts that would uh, make a more f fair and just world w with AI uh, that we'll all be living in, um, or we all are living in. So Rush, do you have a call for action? You'd I mean, pause it. I think education is very important. I think just every time people actually are able to engage in a meaningful way with one of these systems, they get a much more balanced perspective on it. Mm -hmm. I'm, not saying it I'm not saying the reaction is all going to be, oh, it's, it's not that good. It's, sometimes it actually is useful, but they see where they can use it and where they can't. Right. So after this event is over, in a couple of hours, I'm going heading out to a, a local retirement community. So some of the executive director there reached out to me because she said that some of their folks there were, had heard a lot about AI, and they wanted someone to come and talk to them about what it is and are they, should they be worried about it. And so I'm going to go there and talk to them and show them how to use ChatGPT uh, and you know, <laughs> get fun, fun answers from it, draw funny pictures of it. <laughs> just because you know, I think just knowing more about yeah, these systems yeah. is the first step towards demystifying, you know, taking away some of the rhetoric and all the hype and the fear around it. The, you know, the board, board direction is extreme. It's terrible. It's great. Just taking all of that away. It's like, OK, it's just a thing. You, know? you yeah. can use it. You can find your own way to use it. You can, that's where the empowerment comes from. We all find our own ways to interact with the tech. I've talked to people who, they like, I use ChatGPT to make up funny paper titles for my papers. Someone uses it to sort of come up with ideas for something. Someone was telling me they were trying to do something with scheduling, and they used ChatGPT to come up with some initial schedule, and they had some good ideas for how to do some scheduling. Everyone finds their own way into these systems. And I think it's a, empowerment is about giving them the ways to find their own way to interact with them. That, that's the best way we can do it. Kim, how about you? Yeah, I think um, this is probably to take us back to this ideal fairness. And, you know, one of the things I find incredibly heartening is that the machine learning community heard the critique about um, bias in algorithms, and they are 
uh, many people in the community are trying to think about that problem and work towards addressing it. And so my sort of call and for sort of forward sort of thinking about this is more conversations like this, working mm -hmm. across disciplines, working across areas of knowledge. I think we need humanists, social scientists, you know, natural applied scientists, technologists. We need to all be working on these larger questions around technology and AI. And so in many ways, um, I'm really heartened by the fact that, you know, there is an attempt uh, uh, to develop something called fairness. I think there's still a long way to go, but um, that's what I my call would be more conversations, more working across, you know, different fields. Out of curiosity in the audience, can we get a quick show of hands? How many people would identify as coming from the arts and humanities fields of scholarship? Quite a few. How about social sciences? Similar, maybe a few less. Um, physical sciences, not including computer science. And science and engineering. Okay, probably Pretty the largest share. But there's a good mix. Yeah, yeah it's a really fascinating mix. So, to that point, I'd like to ask each of the three of you, thinking you know, in our ecosystem up around here, are there some really exciting things you're doing across disciplinary divides? And I really mean like across, you know, not within the social sciences or within humanities, yeah. but reaching across things either you're doing or you'd like to do or colleagues are doing. Do you have some examples of some Bernoni and uh, interdisciplinarity? Well, yeah. I know that uh, A, I mean, I literally run a joint lab with, with a machine le learning engineer as a social psychologist, right? And uh, this lab has uh, brought in people from, you know, with, with PhDs in bioinformatics. Uh, I had a postdoc for a couple of years with a PhD in English who was reading the things that we were producing to see whether or not just a literate person with not a lot of exposure to psychometrics or machine learning would be able to understand it. Right, uh, as a you know uh, integral part of the team, uh, you know some people were building code, some people were trying to break it, and some people are on the user experience side, just trying to get a sense of, uh, is this interface intuitive? Uh, can we, you know, are the buttons in the places that that I think they should be? So I feel like our our whole enterprise has been fully integrated uh, uh, in terms of cross-disciplinarity. You're a literal bridge yeah. builder. Literally. You're, you're absolutely yeah. doing yep. that. Terrific. Yep. Yeah. Tim or Suresh? Yep. Um, I also run a small lab, the Black Health Data Lab, and um, coming from Purdue, which is my last institution where people did not, you know, work together, you know, big computer science school, um, this has been incredible. I work with people um, like Sohini and Suresh in the data science, and data science have been instrumental fund in my work. I'm working with people uh, in health informatics, um, and I'm working with people in the Center for Digital Health, and then, of course, I'm um, in Africana Studies, which is incredibly interdisciplinary. And so um, one of the first things that someone said when I got here is like, this is truly an interdisciplinary place. Um, that has really sort of borne itself out to be true. So um, a lot of my work is really interfacing with different uh, units and departments across campus, and it's been incredible. Great to hear, fantastic. Suresh. I mean, so let's see. So today morning, I started off with one student scribbling theorems on a board. <laughs> Then was talking to another group of students about um, trying well, working with the group, understanding and analyzing legislative proposals. So we have a law student who's sort of looking at some of these legislative proposals. Um, I am. This doesn't count because it's within DSI. We've been looking at genetic data and looking at governance around gene, and I know nothing about biology or genetics, and so I'm learning there as well. And then also we're you know writing a couple of proposals with folks at um, at, at Cogut and and the arts uh, and, and the uh, Cogut Institute of Humanities on sort of ways in which we can have shared conversations around AI and the, and the humanities and, mm -hmm. and the arts. And um, there's a, we have a reading group, we have a, a sort of a paper group that we discuss papers in, in every month or so. This Friday we have one with a whole bunch of folks from the, from the humanities side. So there's a lot of things that are going on. And this is just, this is just my little, to say, my little piece life. of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's just so much more going on as well at the same time. So yeah. A day in the life that's going to wind up in a retirement <laughs> <and> teaching <laughs> GPT tonight. That's, that's going to be fascinating. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we're going to turn to the audience now for some questions. I'll let Sohini uh, tell you the, the process that we're going to use here. So um, we have some questions that came in through registration, and then there's a QR code to submit more questions. So I'm going to 
identifying themes in the question. So feel free to to use that. Um, but maybe just to start off, I'd like to pull on a thread um, from something that Kim said, which is um, that one uh, person wrote in a question that existing definitions of what makes an algorithm fair can conflict with each other and lead a programmer to have to make difficult choices. Um, so how far are we, like what are some of the challenges in really achieving, is it possible to achieve a unified definition of fairness? Or how should we think about what fairness means for yeah. an algorithm? I'm going to put that over to Malik just because so you were talking about, well, Malik, you were talking about these decisions, right? About, um, you know, first of all, I don't think, just to be, to answer that question, I'm not so sure that there is this idea of fairness because we don't live in a fair world. If AI could create a, a notion of fairness, it's going to be a miraculous sort of innovation because we don't live in a world that's fair. And, and some um, critics of fairness in synthetic data have argued that you can actually create a synthetic data set that's too clean, right? That skews um, sort of uh, the algorithm in such a way that actually then creates a new set of biases or doesn't take up the fact that there are deep structural inequities um, in society that the, then the synthetic data sort of doesn't actually re represent well. But Malik, I really was taken by this idea that, you know, there are some decisions that have to be made about what is going to be sacrificed in order for something else to be more fairer or equitable. And I didn't know if you wanted to weigh in on that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the most succinct answer to unified uh, definition of fairness would be no, uh, but then you know there's a number of of you know evils that we'll have to to weigh and they get weighed uh, right now right now those decisions are being made um and what i'm hopeful for uh is to to gain a number of heuristic heuristics and boundary conditions uh, under which different people may think of something as more or less fair right because you know the same statistics that are governing uh an algorithm that might um, uh, you know, uh, give a recommendation for a, um, a health diagnosis uh, are the same ones that might give a, a recommendation for whether or not somebody should get a loan. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, there may be different perspectives about what kinds of thresholds and tolerance uh, we can uh, live with uh, as a group. And then as you uh, start parsing uh, this by, well, is, is the group that is experiencing, let's say, more false positive rates my group or the other group? Mm -hmm. Does that matter mm -hmm. to how people think about uh, what is or is not fair? And I think it's important to know that uh, on the front end when we're developing these sorts mm -hmm. of things of like, what are these different kinds of demographic uh, considerations? Yeah. What are these different kinds of, um, you know, just uh, uh, boundary conditions and or does the, the amount of, of life or deathness of the, of the decision that's being made, how do these impact what the public thinks? And then how do we feed that back into what, what types of decisions that we make in terms of is this uh, safe to deploy uh, uh, to the public? So hope, hopeful um, that, that this work will, will yield some, some heuristics for us to, to think about in the algorithm development life cycle. I mean, with apologies to you know Russian authors everywhere, all fair algorithms look the same, but every unfair <laughs> algorithm is different in a very different way. And I think that I like to think of uh, fairness measures as really measures of unfairness, not measures mm. of fairness. Hmm. The computer scientists in the room will know that you know the, there's a big difference between um, uh, between P and NP, and sort of or, or between P NP and co NP to be precise. In other words, the negation of a statement is not the same as the, a negation a, a statement itself, and so. It is much easier to point to things and say it is unfair in these different ways. And I think these measures of fairness are actually good lenses or good signals or good mm. sensors for different um, vectors of unfairness. Hmm. What they aren't is measures of fairness yeah. in the sense that if you pass that test, if the sensor doesn't go off, it doesn't mean your system is fair. But if the sensor does go off, then you know it's unfair in a particular way. So I like to think of these different measures of fairness as different light bulbs going off. One bulb might go off today, two might go off in a different setting, and they, and they paint a picture. 
And it's up to us to decide what that picture is telling us yeah. in that particular context. Yeah. So it's great to have different measures because they capture different things. But none of them by themselves is telling the whole story. I love that. I'm wondering, based on a couple questions that have come in, if you can give a little more color to that, because so so a couple of questions that have come in that have noted, as Kim has said, um, we don't live in a fair world, and human beings are already not fair. So are we maybe asking too much of AI yeah. to be fair? So so how does that how might that process look if you see these different light bulbs going off? Like what are the different things that one might be weighing? So first of all, why shouldn't we ask too much? <laughs> Why shouldn't we want better? If we're saying that technology can make us better, why shouldn't we demand more than we expect than we have from humans? So that's the first thing I would say. But secondly, I would say, you know, how do we operation? I think maybe the question is, how do you operationalize this if we're living in a biased world? We we accept that we live in a world that is imperfect in many many ways. We don't stop trying to mm. build in structures that help us get a little bit better at a time. You know, we when we when we talk about the law, it has many many problems but it has a structure in place to try and help us get to a better place at the end of it, right? There is a process, as outcome. And again, I'm not saying that everything is perfect for law, but it, it is our, our best attempt in our imperfect world to achieve some level of justice. It's not zero, but it's not. I think that's what we want with these systems. When we, when we say we want guardrails, when we say we want governance, when we say we want sensors, what we're saying is we want to bring ourselves back into the picture of these discussions. We want to give ourselves more power to make judgments about what the algorithms are doing. We don't want to cede that power to these automated systems. It's an unsatisfying answer for a technical person because, because and, uh, my students are like, but what is the right thing to do? Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know, and you shouldn't be deciding that either. That is not a decision for a programmer to make. <laughs> yeah. You've all talked about, at the beginning, especially um, pivots that led you to this moment in your own careers. What advice do you have for young scholars who are interested in inter interdisciplinary work around AI and its deployment mm. in society um, to engage with this more? And where do you see it going in the coming years? Well, I guess I'll start um, being someone who is, you know, really formally trained in a very humanistic um, sort of field, um, but found my way here because of a variety of different things that I had been doing before and now. I think of the ability to ask questions um, and to embrace the unknown and un the unfamiliar, I think um, is some of the best advice I would give for someone who is really interested around AI technology and power. Um, and start from the, the basis on which I started. Uh, you know, I saw things that I didn't feel comfortable about happening around data specifically and health equity um, and start to ask questions and, and put myself in conversation with people who um, had a different uh, perspective, different training and different education. So that, that would be my advice is to start off with a question and, and don't fear that your question is something that is, you know, um, reductive or not as advanced or sophisticated, uh, but come with those questions and putting yourself um, in the room and in circles where you can start to build and create with other people. Yeah, I, it, in a similar vein, uh, I think that uh, patience with yourself and with others uh, is going to be a huge part of it because you, you're you would be diving partly into a domain that you're not trained in, yeah. uh, that has its own language. Uh, it's almost literally like learning a new language. Uh, if you can bring somebody into the room that can help, uh, that's, that's almost at the intersection mm -hmm. of your work and a person that you want to collaborate with's work, uh, bring them into the room and help, uh, help them help you both talk to each other, right? Uh, you know, there were so many times that, uh, Sarah and I found ourselves at impasses because we were using different words mm. to describe the same things, mm. but we didn't know that, mm. right? Mm. And so then, it, you know, we had to trust each other that, you know, that the other person understood what they were talking about, and we just had to, you know, try to, uh, uh, to figure that out. But uh, bringing in, you know, cultural brokers, in a sense, to help us uh, negotiate that exchange uh, was, a, was a huge part of it. And so, um, yeah, that, that's certainly one, uh, one thing that I would, would say. And uh, email people, knock on people's door, talk mm -hmm. to the people who you think uh, might know a piece of what it is that you want to know and don't know yet, 
Um, and you know, you might end up pulling them into a uh, uh, more deeply in into the into the conversations. You know, so it's it's been a exceptionally vulnerable process uh, for for all of us in this um, you know interdisciplinary ship that we're uh, driving together. But uh, but it's been it's been rewarding, and um, you know, so yeah, patience. I, I like to start talks often by sort of disclaiming my, or sort of declaring my bias up front. I'll tell people I'm a card-carrying computer scientist so they can associate all that comes along with that, which is true because I am one. I, I it, it is, be, you know, it is, I think the word you use vulnerability is good. You have to, you have to be able to embrace being, feeling stupid in many different ways mm -hmm. as you work in many different areas, and that's okay. It's, it's because you're, because there's a lot to learn and there are a lot of other people to learn from, and that's, for me, that, that's the best, the fun part. I think it's good that I have my roots in one field, in my case, computer science, because I have a sense of what I can bring to the table and what I don't know. So you know, I can, I can pretend to be a philosopher. I'm not talking to philosophers. I can pretend to be a lawyer if I'm not talking to lawyers. Um, I, at least I, can, I know the language. I can converse. But I know full well that they are the experts, and I know to reach to them to understand the issue. And I can bring what I offer to the table, yeah. which is an understanding of technology. So it's, it's helpful to have a base, something that you know is yours. And it's helpful to be open to have those conversations with others who have their own base and learn from them. You don't have to be an expert in everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point. In fact, I often, with my students in our interdisciplinary work, speak to the bridge metaphor. Yeah. That you don't have to cross the bridge entirely, yeah. right? The point of having an expert from the other domain to work with is you each come yeah. to a logical midpoint. It may not be the exact middle, but you find a way to have that commonality. And, and Malik, I think you made a great point about language. Yeah. My own field is controls. To an engineer, controls is an algorithm. Mm. To a social scientist, controls might speak of power. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, to a doctor, control is a baseline experiment. Yeah. Wildly different notions. Yeah. You're using a very common word like control. Mm -hmm. So trying to get some translation, maybe it's a third party to help with that, but I think coming halfway and recognizing your strength and their strength and finding yeah, the connection. Mm -hmm. There are a few questions about Google's Gemini, so I'll try to <laughs> phrase it just oh, as yeah. a heads up. Um, so I guess you know maybe one theme here is what what does the news around Google's Gemini uh, image generator um, reveal about the challenges in addressing bias biases in AI models and training data? Yeah. Well, I just want to start by just saying, like, I just discovered, I'm forgetting the name of the, um, the, the, the apps now, I don't know if they're apps, but technology that um, sort of puts a watermark on images, mm -hmm. right, that uh, have been sort of either uh, deep fake images or images that are mm -hmm. being used to train um, algorithms. Um, and so all I'll say about that, and I'll let the people who are more expert in that, is that, you know, in some ways, um, you know, as much as there may be sort of encroachments on people's intellectual property or in other ways, uh, you know, other sort of surveillance or privacy issues, it does seem as though, and I know I talked about tech solutionism, but there are efforts to combat that and respond and encounter that, so. So I have a funny story about Gemini. So I, I do a news of the day in my class because it's so easy to do news of the day nowadays with AI. So this time I put up the title news of the day. I said, okay, I've been training you now for a few weeks. What do you think I'm gonna put up as news of the day today? <laughs> they said, you're gonna put up a Gemini article. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm putting up a Gemini article. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know, maybe I'll, for those who weren't aware, Google put out this new tool, Gemini, and among the things you could do that it didn't do before was do image generation, kind of like some of the other systems were doing. And then people started to play with it, and it was they would ask it things like, yeah, generate an image of a Nazi soldier. And Google very helpfully generated picture, a diverse collection of people who could be Nazi soldiers, including someone who was clearly an Asian woman, someone who was you know, a, a dark-skinned man, in a, you know, things that you would probably not associate with Nazi soldiers in 1943. And of course, this led to a whole hue and cry about whether Google was woke washing facts about the world and so on. There is so much one can unpack in that. You could do yeah. a whole semester's worth of deconstruction of, that, of the narrative around that. All I'll say is that I think Google was trying to do something that they thought was well-intentioned. And fair, right? And, and they did it very non-transparently. <laughs> and I have, a lot of, I have a lot of issues with the fact that I would like to know that they were doing this rather than having it presented to me as the facts, which is, again, an issue about control and power. Who has power over the results I get? And what is happening behind the scenes that I don't have any power over? <clears throat> But there's just so much to say there, so I'll stop yeah. here. I'll just go on forever. <laughs> so 
So maybe that's related to this next question, which is um, that user-centric content platforms like Reddit and Wikipedia are becoming or have been used as training platforms, um, repositories for mm. AI models. So how should we as public consumers and producers of data in those types of repositories think about what that means for AI and power? It's making me rethink being on some of these platforms, which I've done already. Um, yeah, I saw that news about Reddit, and, and um, basically, I think, uh, offering up their, their data for training. Um, yeah, I think it, it's a real call to us to really, again, sort of revisit this idea about what power is. I think a lot of times when we're using these social media platforms, we feel as though we're in control of our own sort of data and the things that we say. I think it's uh, it calls on us to really think more carefully about how we're going to use that, um, how we're going to you know enter those um, interface with those those platforms um, and be more mindful of them. Um, but yeah, it's it's making me personally, and I would advise you know students or you know even you know people in my sort of social circle network to be just much more to be aware that their that data is being used in that way. I probably uh, have a, I don't know, maybe left field kind of reaction to, to that, which is, you know, I think of Reddit also as being um, uh, a, a, an interface that certain demographics deal with and many others don't, right? Mm -hmm. And so then if, if AI is being trained on this type mm -hmm. of vocabulary, these kinds mm -hmm. of interests, you know, yeah. so on and so forth, well, then it's going to, you know, further contribute to, you know, uh, delegitimization de of some groups, yeah. uh, um, you know, styles of, of writing or thinking or interests and, and what have you. Uh, you know, they did not take the OK Player website uh, and, and <laughs> you know, train AI models on that, right, uh, for, for my Roots fans uh, in the room. <laughs> but, um, you know, so, I mean, that, that's like my first reaction. Like, oh, of course they chose Reddit. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that makes all of the sense in the world. Uh, if we're thinking about, you know, how these things become, um, you know, uh, as biased as they are in the first place. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, my, my take is, you know, Google and Facebook became like gazillion dollar companies taking our data already <laughs> and making a lot of money off it. This is, I'm not sure how upset to be about this particular one. Maybe the red users get some money out of this. They're going public and they're going to give a share of their IPO to their users. So. Maybe this, I don't know. It's, 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 yeah. Maybe, maybe I'll sign up for it now. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Too late. Too late. Uh, rats. So maybe um, we're getting close to the top of the hour. So I just want to have kind of a lightning round, one last question for you guys. So, very short answer. Yeah. Ideally, like a word or a couple of words here. Um, if you were to give advice to the folks out here in the room to go read a particular book or a paper, mm. a website, a course to take, feel mm. you know, free to selflessly advertise your course. Um, what resource would you steer the audience to to get better informed about the topics we've talked about today? It could be your own book or your own paper or your own course, but anybody want to jump on that? I guess I'll start really quickly and just, um, you know, there's been a lot of incredible work that's been done and I would argue foundational when we talk about critical AI studies. So Ruha Benjamin, Sophia Noble Umoja, Umoja um, Timnit Gebru, um, to look at, you know, a lot of foundational, um, what I am in the process of writing and, and making a strong case for a lot of black studies scholars who use black studies methods and talked about inequity and oppression. I would go back to a lot of their work, which was foundational for even coming up, um, getting people to think about fairness. Fair enough. Malik? Yeah, I, uh, you know, you, you, you stole my answers. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> uh, those uh, authors are part of the canon of, of our lab as we start to, uh, you know, dive into the interdisciplinarity of it. Uh, these are the, the, you know, some of the, the texts that I have the psychologists or, psych, you know, burgeoning psychologists in the lab read to get, uh, to, to get familiar with the idea space. Uh, soft pitch for Boykin 2021, uh, opportunities <laughs> for a more interdisciplinary approach to, to measuring fairness <laughs> in, in, in uh, machine learning decision systems. Uh, one of my co-authors is in the back of the room, uh, uh, Dr. Togan. 
<laughs> uh, a bioinformatics PhD. See, I really, these people really exist. I wasn't just making them up. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. But, yep. Suresh. So I will also recommend Roe Benjamin's Race After, Race After yeah. Technology. I would mention Virginia Eubanks, Automating Inequality, which talks about the oh, yeah. effects on class, yeah. about how the poor are excessively surveilled by algorithms. And finally, I'll mention a book that's off the beaten track, maybe, uh, uh, Michael Sandel's the, the Moral Limits of Markets. It's about economics. It's about the limits of economics. But I use it as a guidestone to think about the limits of technology. Kim, Malik, Suresh, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. It's Thank you. Great. And thank you all for coming. There's a reception outside, so stick around and continue the conversation. <laughs>